Yeshua fulfilled the law. And thus, it was not necessary for us to keep God's commands. I want to give you two scriptures out of the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is God-breathed and is valuable for teaching the truth, convicting of sin, correcting faults, and training in right living. When that was written, the only scripture that existed was what we now call the Old Testament, the Tanakh. That was the Torah, the prophets, and all the poetry books. If Yeshua fulfilled them and we no longer have to keep what they say, then how could the words of those books teach us about right living, as that verse in 2 Timothy says? And let's read one that bears witness to what that said. Romans 15.4 from Paul. For everything written in the past was written to teach us. Everything written in the past was written to teach us. So that with, that, with the encouragement of the Tanakh, we might patiently hold on to our hope. If these passages are correct, then how can we justify taking the position that Yeshua has tossed aside the law, the Torah, and the foundation of our faith, the Old Testament? But sadly, that's what a lot of people actually believe. And that's why we have so many believers that hold to so many different interpretations of the scriptures. While there are so many denominations out there, some of them are very similar, but they split on interpretations of one or two principles. Many of them are not foundational principles. They're actually relatively minor, but because they hold different views, they start a new denomination. That's not what God had intended. I remember when I first started t attending Beth Adonai and started really grasping the Jewishness of Yeshua and understanding the Bible. It began to become alive. Whereas before I would read the Bible, there were words on a page. Now they were leaping off the page. They were alive. They were real. The people I was, I were, was reading about were no longer just people of the past. They became living, breathing people. I began to feel as if I actually knew them. Completely transformed my way of reading the scriptures. And here's something that we don't often hear. After Yeshua's death and resurrection, guess what? The early church continued to follow Judaism, despite what you may have been taught. It wasn't until the Gentiles began to come into the faith in large numbers, which began with Cornelius in Acts chapter 15, that things really began to change. Even though the debate early on was about whether Gentiles had to keep the law, history tells us that the vast majority of believers, both Jewish and Gentile, continued to keep the feasts and follow the Torah for several centuries after Yeshua's resurrection. The big cutoff was in the 4th century when Constantine declared Christianity to be the official state religion and forced everyone to become Christian. That's when things really changed. And we talked about that in de detail when I talked a few weeks ago about the Greek influence on the body of Messiah. Constantine made it illegal to practice Judaism, to celebrate feasts such as Passover, and instead he required that people keep man-made holidays such as Easter. Everyone, and this is important, regardless of whether they had given their life to Yeshua or not, was required to become part of the state-sponsored church. Christianity was then truly severed from its root of Judaism. Now, given how many hundreds of years it's been since Constantine's time, it's, it's very easy to understand why we have such a difficult time today interpreting what our Bible says and what Yeshua's words mean. So there, let's get on with the journey and talk about some, some real meat here this morning. There's unfortunately no explicit statement that I can point to in the scripture that says explicitly that, yeah, Yeshua was a Jew. He followed Jewish law and traditions. That verse is not in our Bibles, but there are other verses. When you understand the context, very, very clear. They leave no doubt. And context, as in all things, is key. And if you think back to your literature classes in school, when you studied writers, playwriters such as Shakespeare, when you studied the Greek philosophers, Plato, Aristotle, and so forth, your professor would give you background. He, would set the con he or she would set the context so that you could understand what these writers were saying. Unfortunately, the New Testament doesn't have that context clearly stated like that. 
because, and there's good reasons, most of your scholars believe that the Gospels were actually written for a Gentile audience. They were written at the request of the Gentiles, the modern Gentiles that were there at the time. Because when you look back on Jewish history, they didn't write things down unless, God, unless it was the Torah that God instructed them to write. They passed things down orally. They would memorize and continue and, and teach the next generation. Memorization, memorization. So they, the Jewish people were not really writing these things down, but as the body of Messiah grew and more and more Gentiles came into the faith, the Gentiles wanted these things written down because they were used to writing things down. So therefore, it, they were written for the people in that, in that day. So they didn't set the context for future generations. They didn't have future generations in mind. Same thing with the epistles. They were written to address specific situations going on in the body at the time. There was no need to set the context. It's just, here's the problem, here's the solution. So that's why they were not history books. They were not written to be scripture. It was only later that they were canonized and became part of scripture. So that's why we don't have that historical information in there. So we have to kind of look at other sources and piece together the whole picture. One of the most obvious things that obscures the identity of Yeshua's Jewishness is his name, Jesus. So I mentioned earlier, his real name was Yeshua. That's what he was called. And that means salvation. But guess what? We also see other people throughout the New Testament that have the same situation. Their names have been changed. For example, Miriam. In the New Testament, often it is translated as Mary. And there's others. Here's, here's an interesting one I want to point out quickly. Yaakov, Jacob. Okay? Then when we see it translated in the New Testament, we, uh, in the book of James, we see it as James. And, and there's an easy solution. There was nothing nefarious behind this. I know there's some people that have taught that King James wanted his name in there. When you really, and I used to believe that. I'll be honest with you. I'd heard that and I believed it. But as you begin to really study and see what happened, it's pretty simple what happened. The Old Testament was primarily written in Hebrew and maybe some Aramaic, okay? With the original writings didn't have any Greek influence in them. On the other hand, the New Testament was written in Greek, so that Greek influence was all through it. When the names were put down, they had already been Hellenized in society. So their names were, for example, Mary instead of Miriam. And with James, James is a really interesting one because we see a lot of these words, they went, or names and even the words, went from Greek, then they went into Latin. Some of them went into German before they even came into English. And the Latin word, Yaakov, that name, actually there's, there's two forms of it. One of them can be translated Jacob, one can be translated as James. So it was just simply in the translation that the book of James came to be called James. But even though there was, nothing, there was nothing bad behind it, it still obscures the fact that these were Jewish men. It makes us think about them as Western modern people, which they were not. If their names had been translated directly from Hebrew into English, that confusion wouldn't really be there. We would still see Miriam. We would still see Jacob, wherever that name Yaakov was used. So just wanted to throw that out there. And then artwork. Oh, yeah, artwork's a biggie. I know all of you will recognize this one. The Last Supper, which is really, as we know, a Passover Seder. This one is interesting because this is by Da Vinci. It doesn't reflect the Jewishness of the meal, and I know it's small and it's hard to see. But one of the hallmarks of Passover is unleavened bread. The bread on this table, guess what? It's leavened, okay? So that completely obscures the Jewishness of what was happening there. And if you'll review the list of feasts in Leviticus 11, what you'll see is that most, most of them, well, actually all of them, have been obscured. Some of them have been ignored. Some of them have been changed. For example, Passover in our modern society and the Christian community has been replaced by Good Friday. The Feast of First Fruits has been replaced by Easter. Shavuot 
has been replaced by Pentecost. And it's not just the names that have changed. The dates have changed. They follow a different calendar. And even the way they're celebrated has changed. So it's completely removed the Jewishness of these feasts from themselves. And this is really a very simplistic explanation of how his Jewish identity became hidden. And I don't have time to go into full detail on it today because I want to go now and look at a few situations in the Bible that clearly show us his Jewishness. The first confirmation we have of his Jewishness is in the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, in his genealogy. So right off the bat, we're told about all these Jewish people he descended from. He came from the tribe of Judah and the line of King David, who was Jewish. And then we see all the other Jewish men that were listed in that genealogy. Then as a child, we see that his parents observed Passover in Jerusalem. And for the sake of time, I won't read that passage, but if you want to read it, it's Luke chapter 2, verses 41 through 47. It talks about when he was 12 years old, and they went to Jerusalem, and then they started home, and they couldn't find him. And he was in the temple with the scribes and the Torah teachers, impressing them with his knowledge of the Torah. He had excelled so much in his studies that he amazed those teachers in that temple. So he was growing, he was learning and studying within a Jewish context. And that was actually the typical path of a Jewish boy of his age. And they would study and progress in their studies. And then by the age of 15, if they had the resources, they would go into full-time study. Yeshua, since he was from a poor family, the typical trend there would have been to go into a trade. And we see that he did. He went into his father's trade as a carpenter. But we still see his wisdom. And then we see later, when he was 30, roughly 30, where he actually became a rabbi himself, even though he had to go into a trade and wasn't able to complete formal studies. But God had given him wisdom. may have to skip a little of this for the sake of time. Let me just check something real quick. Yeah, let's move past this. Okay. Now, if you were like me talking about the disciples, you probably have always thought that the fact that he had this group of people around him that were following him and learning from him, that meant he was unusual. That meant he was exceptional. He was extra special. And yes, he was. He was the son of God. There is no question. All that is true about him, but not because he had these disciples around him. That was actually pretty typical at that time. You would have a rabbi, he would have these disciples, and they would follow the rabbis everywhere to learn from the rabbi, and not just to learn from him, but to learn to be like him. They were raising these, this younger generation to replace them, to know what they knew. They were giving them all their knowledge. Yeshua was doing the same thing that was very typically Jewish. What was different and made him special is because of who he was, the Son of God. And we are to be disciples. When we talk about being disciples or Talmudim in Hebrew, that means we're to become like our rabbi. The difference with us, we're supposed to become like our rabbi. Our rabbi is Yeshua. And we are also supposed to raise disciples. But it's different. We're not supposed to raise uh, disciples to be like us but to be like our rabbi, Yeshua. So that's the difference. I'm going to look at a few passages now. Let's start with Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 to 20. And this is often used to prove that Yeshua invalidated the Torah, and it tells us just the opposite. It says, don't think that I have come to abolish the Torah or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to complete Yes, indeed, I tell you that until heaven and earth pass away, not so much as a yud or a stroke will pass from the Torah. Not until everything that must happen has happened. So whoever disobeys the least of these mitzvot, these commands, and teaches others to do so will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever obeys them and so teaches will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness is far greater than that of the Torah teachers and the perishim, the Pharisees, you will not, certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. And most of your translations use the word fulfill there rather than complete, but it's the same concept. He came to show us how 
to live out the Torah, not to get rid of it, how to live it out. And if you continue reading in that chapter what you see, and we just read it, nothing is passed away. Heaven and earth still stand. And it, and actually, if, I would like you on your own to start in verse 21 and read through the rest of the chapter because it's eye-opening. When you stop there, you, you can kind of cut it off, keep reading. You're going to find out it is still valid. Let's get this up. There we go. We often overlook the fact that Yeshua's dress was Jewish. It's almost certain that he donned to fill in something we don't usually think of. And we have several verses in the gospel that inform us that he did indeed wear zitzit. Matthew 9, 20 is a story of a woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years. She approached Yeshua from behind and he touched the hem of his garment, his zitzit, and she was healed. We see in Matthew 14, verse 36, that there was a group of people from Gennesaret. They recognized him and they begged to touch the fringe of his cloak, his zitzit, and all who touched it were completely healed. We also read about him attending synagogue in a number of places. In Luke 4, we, talk, we see where he went into a synagogue. He taught and everyone respected him. That's in verse 15 of chapter 14. So we see that he did indeed live his life as a Jewish man of that time. And I'm going to have to skip some more because we are really getting out of time here. Oh, I want to talk about this one. Where is? Let me see if I can find that one. Here we go. Nope, that's 20. Yeah. 22. Nope. Here we go. This is the one I want to look at. We're taught that Yeshua disagreed with the teachings of the Pharisees. Those hypocritical Pharisees. We hear it all the time, okay? Yeshua was always on their case, telling them how terrible they were. If we take a closer look, however, we see a little bit of a different picture here. This is Matthew chapter 23, verses 2 and 3. And it records a command from Yeshua that his disciples should obey even the stringencies of the scribes and the Pharisees. They said on the Sanhedrin, that was the highest human religious authority in Judaism at that time. In that verse, the Torah teachers and the Perashim, he said, sit in the seat of Moshe, Moses. So whatever they tell you, take care to do it, but don't do what they do because they talk but don't act. In other words, he recognized the truth of what they were teaching, and he told his disciples to keep those teachings. The problem is that they had become pious and they didn't always walk the talk. So that's what he was teaching against, not what they were teaching, but what they were doing or failing to do. Okay, big difference there. Let's look at this, John 4.22. We have a passage that provides us with a head-on acknowledgement of Yeshua's Jewishness. This is an important one. You people don't know what you are worshiping. We worship what we know because salvation comes from the Jews. Okay? Remember the name Yeshua means salvation. He, salvation, came from the Jews kind of hard to get around that one. I want to talk quickly about the Last Supper. I showed the image of it up here a few moments ago as da Vinci depicted it. Most believers, because of artwork such as that, do not realize that it was actually a Passover Seder. And I want to focus on one of the events of that night that proved that claim. Remember, this occurred just before Yeshua's arrest, which would lead to his crucifixion. So it was at the very end of his life. What he did that night was very Jewish. So if he had turned from Judaism, as so many people assert he did, we would not expect him to do what he did that night. And this story is in Luke chapter 22, if you want to take time to read it. As you know, the Jewish Seder has four cups, and you see them up here. Although opinions vary as to what certain cups actually symbolize, most agree that the first cup is the Kaddush, which means sanctification. With this cup, the Passover Seder begins. The second cup is called the cup of plagues. Remember dipping your finger in and counting out the plagues? 
The third cup is referred to as either the cup of redemption or the cup of blessing. The fourth cup is often called Hallel, which means praise, though some traditions refer to it as the cup of acceptance, and even some use it as the cup of Elijah. It's this third cup that I want to talk about quickly. This one is traditionally taken after the meal, and it's referred to by Yeshua as, in Luke 22, 20, the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Jews for Jesus points out that Yeshua draws on something from Jewish tradition to provide insights not previously understood by the people until that time. By calling this cup the new covenant in my blood, he makes a direct reference to the promise of Jeremiah chapter 31, where God had declared that he would make a new covenant because the previous covenant had become broken. To violate a covenant agreement with God would surely incur his wrath and judgment, a terrible cup. But instead, God promised a new covenant of grace and salvation. Yeshua declared that this new covenant would be poured from that third cup, the cup of salvation in his blood. The cup of redemption stood for more than the Hebrews escape from Egypt. It stood for the plan and purpose of God for all the ages. Judgment and salvation, wrath and redemption, they're all brought together in the mystery of that one cup, explained by Messiah there in that room with his disciples. And he was not speaking of the cup in a purely symbolic manner. He was describing the events that would soon occur in his own life and would even begin later that evening in the Garden of Gethsemane. And there he cried out to the Lord in his anguish prayer. And this is, this is telling. It's a passage that a lot of Christians have trouble understanding what he's saying. He said, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. How many wondered why that word cup was used there? That's why. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So the cup he willingly took to bring salvation to us is something that is part of all Passover seders and therefore very, very Jewish. Pretty interesting, huh? Something else I'll touch on very briefly. I don't have time to go through all these notes, but when Yeshua came, he spoke several times, several passages where he talks about, I came only for the lost sheep of Israel. In fact, he sent out his disciples to go out and proclaim the gospel and told them to only go to the house of Israel. Then what we see is just before his ascension, what does he do? He tells his disciples to go out and make disciples, starting in Jerusalem, then into Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. So we see at that point, then the Gentiles are ministered to. But when he came, he was trying, the whole goal was to come, get the Jewish people to understand the truth, the validity of how the Torah was to be lived out. And then they could take that word and they could proclaim it to the nations. The Gentiles were never left out. But that initial time when he came down, the first time he came, it was for the purpose of instructing the people. A lot of them rejected him, but a lot of them did accept him. And Messianic Judaism is the result of that acceptance. And you see how it's growing in this day and age. Okay, I'm going to skip this part, so give me just a second. Okay. Let's talk about this, and we'll end after this. In reality, most people acknowledge that Yeshua was Jewish, but many believe he's no longer Jewish. He became a Christian, and he taught against Judaism. How many times have we heard that? But nothing could be further from the truth. I want you to think about this. If he taught against Judaism, he also taught against keeping the Torah. However, Deuteronomy 13 warns against any prophet that counsels the people of Israel to abandon the law. So what... So do we really believe that Yeshua would do such a thing? No. And if he did, it would certainly disqualify him from being the Messiah. Okay? So let's, let's just rest it, the argument there. Yeshua was a Jew during his lifetime, and he continues to be so. He expects his followers to obey his father's commands. He will forevermore be a Jew. We're told in the scriptures that he is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And that applies to status as a Jew. Now, as I said earlier, I'm not telling you if you're a Gentile that you need to convert to Judaism. On the contrary, as Paul said, we are to remain as we were called. We each have a role, a distinctive role. They're different, but they work together in a beautiful, 
beautiful tapestry that God is weaving. But when we understand Yeshua, who he was, his culture, it makes our relationship with the Lord become alive. It makes reading the scriptures, they become very real. And while the quality of our relationship with the Lord is extremely important, I don't want you to miss what I'm about to say. There's something that's even more important. We know him. If our relationship is not perfect, we still know him. The most important thing is to know him. And that brings us to the salvation of those who do not yet know him. And did you know that how we relate to Yeshua has a direct impact on that? Think about the unsaved Jewish people. Okay? As we begin to recognize that Yeshua is truly a Jew, he was truly a Torah-observant Jewish man, and that he will be when he returns, instead of portraying him as the erroneously Gentile Messiah that we have painted him as, it creates an environment where the Jewish people can accept him. And that's important. Because Deuteronomy chapter 17 and verses 8 through 13 requires that any Jew who rejects the leadership of the Jewish governing body, and that would include abiding by the Torah as well as the Jewish traditions, was to be put to death. Now in today's world they wouldn't be put to death by the Jewish community, but they would be expelled. So, if Jewish rejected the Torah and Judaism, what does that mean? That means they can't accept him as the Messiah. But when they understand that he was a Jewish man, he never taught against the Torah. He never taught against the tr traditions. He taught against replacing the Torah with the traditions, and we talked about that at length last year. But he never taught against the traditions themselves. Just for this, he followed. He he worked within that framework of the law and the Jewish traditions. And when we acknowledge that, when we present him as he truly is, that gives them the ability to accept him and see who he truly is. And I want to tell you something. I found this really exciting. This is actually beginning to happen. There was a survey conducted by the Barna Group in 2017 that found that, get this, 21% of Jewish millennials believe that Yeshua was, quote, God in human form who lived among people in the first century. Okay, and it's really exciting when you consider that 80% of those who responded to this survey identify themselves as being religious Jews. Okay? Several scholars actually believe that there's a considerable number of Jewish people who do believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. But they're afraid to publicly admit it because they don't want to be kicked out of their families, out of their synagogues. They are afraid of losing that community that they have if they acknowledge it publicly. But truly, they do believe it. So, it's very important. It's important for us and our relationship with God, and it's important in setting up an environment when we portray him for who he really is so that Jewish people can accept him. So, with that said, let's, I'm a few minutes over. Thank you for your patience, and let's go ahead and close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your words. We want to thank you that you've preserved these words for us for all these millennia. We want to thank you for the Jewish people that you've given us to preserve the words and, and so that we have them today and can know who you are and can know you. Father, we want to pray that you would use your words to draw us closer to you. Help us that we would see the Jewishness of Yeshua that we would be able to see your word for what it truly means, for what it truly is. And Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters, the Jewish people as well as those of other nations who do not yet know you. We pray for their salvation. We pray that we would have the, the strength, the, the boldness to go out and proclaim who Yeshua truly is so they can see him in all his glory and all his splendor for who he truly is. And Father, that they would receive him as Messiah and be brought into your kingdom for all eternity. In Yeshua's name, amen.